Honestly, I hardly ever go live, so I'm still trying to learn this stuff. But I hope y'all are good. Hey, Jess. Hey, Morris. All right. So I wanted to go live and talk about my journey of overcoming addiction. So last, hey Alonzo. So last year I dropped a video um, talking about my porn addiction testimony. And I wanted to go live and talk about the same thing for anybody that has ever dealt with porn addiction. And honestly, it doesn't even really matter what type of addiction it is, but I found that there have been a lot of similarities in addiction that can happen so i'm just gonna dive in and talk about my testimony of how i got introduced to porn at such a young age and how broken i felt how i felt like i would never get out of it and also how i overcame this thing and then i'm gonna also answer some questions that i got from my IG story and talk about some practical tips that can help if you're somebody, even if you don't deal with the addiction in the same area, but it can still help you. So I was, I want to say when I was in the second grade that this was the very first time that I had ever been introduced to any porn grabber website. So I was in second grade, so I used to go to daycare back when I was younger. And after school one day, I ended up going to daycare and I used to play in a little girls group. And in this little girls group, we used to, you know, kind of do what girls do, dance around, make little songs, do little cheers and play little games in daycare. And one thing that we talked about this day was we started listing out the websites that we would go on whenever we would play games online. And we would, you know, stuff like girls go games and all that stuff, like cooking games and dress up games. And I remember one of the girls in the group. So she, she paper. So she tore off a sheet of paper and put on the sheet of paper a website for me to go to to play games. So mind you, I'm just looking to innocently, I'm just looking to play games. I'm just looking to do maybe like a little girl's racing game, a little girl's dress up game, a little girl's, I don't know, something like that, a little cooking game. So I go home and I type in the website. So I'm, I, did I say this already? But I'm in like second grade. So I go on the computer, I type it up, and I'm like, oh. my eyes could not believe what I saw after I typed in this thing. So you could imagine, I'm looking like, trying to match up the website to what was on the paper. And I'm like, surely, surely either I wrote it down wrong, she wrote it down wrong, and still to this day, I don't even know what or how that happened maybe she just gave me the wrong letter I don't know but I ended up looking on this thing and this was the very first time that my eyes had ever saw what I saw like just seeing naked people seeing people have sex online I was in second grade so I had to be like six or seven years old so I'm like mind blown and I'm staring at the computer like this cannot be <laughs> I'm like, I just came on here to play a game. I just came on here to do dress up my little doll baby. I just came on here to dress up. Like, I'm not looking for none of this. And so after this, I I just ended up turning off the computer. Or I don't, I don't even know what I did that day. But either I turned off the computer or just went to another website. And I was like, okay, that was kind of weird. But yeah, so... I moved on from that, and then so let's fast forward some years to the end of elementary school. So the time between 
fifth grade and sixth grade, you know that transition period where you are in like that summer, the summertime area. So you're not in school, but you could be doing whatever. Oh, thank you, girl. <laughs> I just took my braid out out. But thanks. So yeah, so you know how you're in that period where you're between fifth grade and sixth grade. And so you, you got a little summertime. So around this time, um, I was at a place. And it was, it was a safe place that I was at. And I woke up and innocently again, I have a moment where I go to turn on the TV. And as soon as I turn on the TV, like I have my breakfast with me. And as soon as I turn on the TV, porn pops up. And I'm like, again, I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't asking for it. I wasn't, I, I was just going out my daily life while, you know, and I see yet again another opportunity to watch this thing. And I'm a little bit older than I was when I was in second grade. So I know what I'm seeing. I know I see two people, they're doing the do. And around this time, it starts to linger a little bit. And I'm like, Hmm, like, what am I seeing here? And at this time, I'm still shocked. I'm still like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm alone again. And after watching it for a little bit, I'm like, okay, I can't sit here and watch this thing all this time. So I end up just clicking off and going back to my regular cartoons or regular shows that whatever shows I would watch back when I was in sixth grade. I'm well, fifth grade. So that was that. And one of the things that I realized is that sometimes at a young age, the enemy can start planting little seeds in our heads. So I don't know whether you guys realize this or not, but when I'm listening to people's testimonies, and it doesn't even have to be about this, but it could just be testimonies about um, maybe women who were raped when they were younger or men who were raped when they were younger. Um, people who are molested, people who were introduced to drugs, people who are introduced to porn. A lot of times it starts when they're younger. And I'm like, why is that? And I realize that a lot of times that these seeds are planted when you're younger, because when you're younger, your mind is easily moldable. You don't know a lot. You don't have a lot of wisdom. And another thing I realize is that it sometimes it finds us when we're when we're young and we're secluded or we're by ourselves. So just like in that moment when I went to go on to the, the computer or I went to go on to the TV to watch something, I was alone. I didn't have an adult right there in the moment to say, uh-uh, turn that off and rebuke that. I didn't have anybody in that moment. And so I see that a lot of times that seeds are planted when we're younger because we don't really know. We don't, we don't really know any better. That's why we need parents. That's why we need guidance. And I find that very, very strategic, how sometimes the enemy can work in planting these seeds. And so how, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we are sponges. So when we're younger, every, I know that from the, I can't remember what the age is from like the times when you're a baby up until like three years old, like your brain, like you're soaking up so much and kids are able to learn so much in that short span of time that they're able to learn multiple languages in that time they're able to learn words and mannerisms and all that during this time and so do you like I don't take it as a coincidence that a lot of times these seeds are planted whenever we're younger because we're easily moldable and so fast forward to after fifth grade after seeing this thing I started having an unnatural urge to start watching this thing again so you see how that is that the seeds were planted and then after these encounters maybe some weeks or something later what birthed from that was having the desire to watch it and having the desire and, and then not only that but not wanting to tell anybody about it um trying to go away so that nobody knew and another thing is a lot of a lot of times that we do this thing in secret and when it comes to porn addiction or a lot of these addictions is that sometimes we do these and 
we feel like we don't want to talk about it and we don't want to tell anybody and it makes it 10 times worse because people don't know what they can help you with if you hide it in secret and so because I was hiding this thing in secret it was able to go on for so long and after this going on for so long, I find myself being in a constant cycle of watching this thing. Okay, I have the desire to watch it. I go watch it. I feel horrible about myself. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and fix this thing. I don't want to do this anymore. So let me try and go two weeks without it. And then boom, I fall back again. I have another desire to watch it. I watch it. I feel horrible. I'm like, God, oh my gosh, please help me. And a lot of times in these times when we're in these cycles, we're like, God, help me. God, help me. Like, I don't want to do this thing no more. It's, it's an unnatural desire that we have that we're like, I don't want to do this thing no more. I keep thinking about it. I keep trying to do it on my own. I keep trying to say, make little bets with myself and say, I don't want to do this thing anymore. But we still find ourselves in the negative cycle of wanting to do it, doing, wanting to do it, doing it, then feeling guilty, crying back for forgiveness, and then having a negative cycle go on and on again. And throughout this time, I had, I had, I had a relation. And I guess I could say I was still a baby at this time. You know, still knowing how to pray, still knowing how to call on God. And I was like, God help. You know, like, I can't stop this. And so at this time, I would go to church and go to the altar. And I would pray and I would say, God, help me. I don't want to watch this anymore. Like, I don't want to. Yeah, like in those cycles, like, I don't want to watch this anymore. I don't want to be in this anymore. I don't want to. I don't want to be in this negative cycle anymore. And one of the one of the scriptures that came to mind was the one where Paul said, God, what did he, he was like, uh, it's like in Romans 6, 6. Let me read it. So he said, is it that one? Honestly, the one that I'm looking for is the, I do what I ought not do. Hold on. Let me find it. That way I'm not just saying it. That which I should do. All right, so it's Romans 7, 15. So it says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And so it takes me back to that time to where you don't want to do a certain thing. And even if you don't have the same addiction, like some of us, your, your addiction could be weed. Your addiction could be sex. Your addiction could be, I don't know, it could be something. But the thing that you don't want to do is sometimes a thing that you're drawn the most to do. And I, I, I found myself relating with Paul that even when we're in this cycle, we find ourselves continuing to say, God, help me. I don't want to do this thing no more. But... We realize that, but we realize that it's the sin that dwells in us that's making us do this thing. You will make a great therapist. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. All right. Um, but when I when I found myself in this negative cycle, I was really starting to be at the altar praying constantly and then I would go back home after Sunday and do the exact same thing look at Romans 6 1 okay let's look at Romans 6 1 ah okay so well in my bible it says the dead to sin alive to God so Romans 6 1 says what shall we say then are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And I'm going to just keep reading on because I feel like the other part is good too. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him 
by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we too might walk in the newness of life. And I like I like that y'all pointed out this scripture because sometimes that we think that because Jesus has died and he's given us the grace to do these things. Sometimes you may think, well, God gave me grace. So I can just continue to live in this sin. It's like, no, that is, that is not it. That Jesus died so that we can have life and have have it more abundantly. And he died to the sin. So that means that we shouldn't continue to live in the thing that Jesus died for us for. So, all right. So um, one of the things that I started doing when I was dealing with this was I'm trying to remember what did I stop at I stopped at okay so I was going to the altar continuing to repent well I guess I really wasn't repenting but I was just saying God help me yeah Romans is Romans is good it yeah because it's a clear representation of a new convert of Christ it is it is and I want to say that one thing about Romans is that it really shows you that Jesus died for us to have power over all these things, that the blood of Jesus Christ, that when, when Jesus died, he died so that we all could die to our sin and start living in the newness of his life, start living in the newness of him. And that we no longer had to be bound by porn addiction and honestly, any other things that you feel bound by, whether that be anxiety, whether that be depression, whether that be lust, sex before marriage, like all, all those things, unforgiveness, and yeah, so um, finishing my I'm trying to think. So I ended up going, continuing to go to church, and um, I feel like I wasn't an, an avid church goer at the time. I mean, I would go, and then every time I would go, it would be continuing to go to the altar and pray about the exact same thing. And it wasn't until. Um, and I was still continuing to draw closer to Christ, like still praying and still going to church every now and then listening to sermons and all that. But I was still having this horrible, this horrible cycle in the dark, <laughs> in the thing that I was doing. Um, and I went to a Bible study and one of the men that was on there, he talked about his very porn addiction. And that was the very first time that I had ever sat in a Bible study or anything of a church setting where somebody had said, oh, I, yeah, like, I remember there were nights where I couldn't stop watching porn. And that was the very first time. And it kind of shook me a little bit because I'm like, you, you can talk about that in church? Because I don't know whether y'all know or whether y'all been to the, you know, you grew up in the South and you, you being in the, the black churches, like, they don't really be talking about a whole lot of that, you know? It's of course like they they shout, they praise, they worship, but it seems like they don't really dive deep into the things that we struggle with on a day to day basis. Like they don't. It seems like I had never really heard people talk about like, yeah, I used to deal with that. Like I used to struggle with that. They don't ever really talk about it out loud. So it seems as if it's taboo to talk about it in a church setting or on a pulpit in general. And then you have kids like me, and then you have kids like you who are in the audience and you're truly dealing with some real life stuff and you don't think that you can overcome it because you don't hear anybody else talk about it. And I had to hear that from him because what it did was it set free in me that, okay, well, if he used to do it that and he's up here preaching, I could be free from that too. <laughs> Like, I don't have to be continuously bound by this thing. And when I, at the end of that Bible study, I went up and I, I said, hey, I used to, I used to deal with that too. <laughs> and you see how that sounds? You see how, like, whenever we're living in, whenever we're, whenever we're bound by things, it's hard for us to get up and say it and say, like, hey, I'm struggling, like, I'm struggling. Like, I'm, I've been trying to let go of these things for the past nine years, 10 years, and I just can't stop. I, I really can't stop. But one of the things about that is it gave, it opened up the door for the opportunity for me to say, like, hey, I'm, even though I was whispering, I said, hey, like, I, like, I dealt with the same thing too. 
And that opened up the door but for God to be able to work because I had to admit public. That was the first time publicly I had ever admitted that I was dealing with something. And you know how in the beginning when I said that we do these things behind closed doors and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to be ashamed. We don't want people to start looking at us crazy. So we never even admit that we are bound by something behind closed doors. So that was the very first time that I could ever admit it. And I think that that's one of the very first steps is finding somebody that you can at least say, like, look, like your girl is struggling or your boy, like I'm struggling here. Like I need help. I heard your testimony and I need to hear exactly like, how do I get free from this thing? So the very first thing was admitting it. And the next thing was going to God and saying, God, I understand that Jesus died on the cross for me to be free from this thing. I understand that I'm not, I'm not able to do this in my own strength. I'm not able to, like, I, obviously, if I could do it, I would have been did it by now. And some of us think that we can do a lot of these things on our own, but it goes to show that our self, our self control, is only it, it's only capped to so much. Like we can't really do a whole lot. I like we can't do these things on our own because we we think our discipline and our motive, like the motivation, gets us there. And we, in actuality, we realize that after two weeks, we're relapsing. After two days, we're, re- we're relapsing and we realize that, you know what, I can't do this on my own. So I need somebody greater than me to help me. Exactly. Like it doesn't belong to us. Right. So like the power belongs to Jesus. He's the one that can help us get through this thing. He's the one that can help us grow through this addiction that we have. And that's a And that's so step one was truly confessing out of my mouth. I, I struggle with porn addiction. And then two is confessing that Jesus is the only one that can help us. Because if, any, if anybody's like me, you probably tried some other things. You probably tried some other stuff. You probably tried bribing yourself, making bets, saying, okay, I can go four days. I can go five days. You know what I'm saying? And then even those failed. Even those didn't work. And even things like uh, I know there's a community on YouTube that was called No Fat and how it talks about having the discipline or have or having the willpower. That's the word. Having the willpower to get on these get over these things. And I'm like willpower only one willpower will run out. It's a relief talking about it. Charnay, did I say your name right? It's a relief talking about it, but it's definitely hard. I thank God every day. I'm six years sober, relapsed twice. God is my savior. But thank you, Jesus, that yes, that you're six years sober. But yeah, it's definitely a relief talking about it. Because once you get that thing out, you're like, all right, I can start taking the next steps to getting over this thing. (laughs) All right. So after realizing that Jesus is the one who can, it's all through him, you did also Thank God. Yes. I'm so glad, Zaria. So after realizing that Jesus is the one that can help us get through this, I had to start taking um, some of the practical and spiritual steps. And I want to go with the practical steps first, because I think those were the practical steps that I started. Kiara. Hey, Okay, My bad. Kiara. Okay. Hey, Kiara girl. Um, but I started taking some practical steps after this and realize I want y'all to realize that some, 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 like this wasn't an overnight thing, but it wasn't me walking this thing out. So I'm going to go with one of the practical steps. So one person asked the question on my, uh, question thing, questionnaire thing. And the question was, How did, or what are some steps that you took in order to overcome these things? So, excuse me, I'm going to talk about the practical steps and then I'm going to go into the spiritual steps that I took. Um, So one of the practical steps was I just started taking inventory of the things that led me in order, that led me into this sin. So you know how you got, you know how you do a kid with an allergy test? 
Should I use that one? All right, so you know how you have a child with an allergy test and you don't really know what your child is allergic to. So what you do is you start introducing some things or you start taking inventory of the things that your child already eats and you start looking for flare-ups in your child. You start looking for flare-ups in your child to see what exactly led to that thing occurring. So one thing that I started doing was I started taking inventory of the things that would cause flare-ups in me and that would lead to me wanting to then act on my uh well act on the the porn addiction that I had so one of the things that I would do is I would take inventory and I would start um paying attention to the music I listened to the places I went the conversations I was having and one of the things that I realized is that after part after listening to sexual music if it was later that day or maybe the next day or maybe two days later, I would go back and I'm like, dang, like I have a strong urge to like a strong sexual urge right now. I'm like, why? Like, why is that? But the, the practical step I took was taking inventory and going back and realizing, OK, what did I do? All right, I went here, I went to school, I went to, went to ah, when I was walking to class, I was listening to some Trey songs. Or when I was walking to class, I was listening to some music that was real, real nasty, right? And I used to love that music. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I used to really love the music. But then I started realizing that the music that I had been listening to was causing me to fall. And not only that, but I had to start taking inventory. Sometimes the places you go. The places you go, like sometimes maybe if you go to the club or you go to a place that has a, a lot of real... I'm trying to think like a a certain environment that you're in that leads to you wanting to start acting on your sexual desires. And so you get home and you realize that, dang, like, why am I having such a strong urge to act on this thing? And you go back and you're like, oh, I was at the club, at the club dancing on somebody. You know what I'm saying? So that it makes you want to act on this thing. And another thing I had to do was make sure I was taking inventory of the conversations that I was having. So you know how if you're in a relationship with somebody or even if you're around your friends or something and the conversation starts switching to sex and you have now fed yourself with the thoughts of having sex, the thoughts of of doing this thing. So now when you go home, your mind has been thinking on it. Your mind has been on this thing, like cooking on this thing. And so you start wanting to act on it. And you, you, you realize that when you get home, you realize that when you get home, it's starting to flare up. So that was one of the practical steps I had to do. So I had to take inventory of the things that led me to sin and take inventory of the things that control my thoughts. So the music controlled my thoughts. The conversations controlled my thoughts. The... Places that I went control my thoughts. And so I started taking out the things that in anything that led to these things. So if, if it's a nasty song, I got to turn it off, especially if I know it was a song that led me back, like leads me back to having those thoughts. Or if it's a certain place, I'm like, I can't I, I just can't go. I just can't go. And if it's like, let's just say if I, if I was dating somebody and the conversation turned sexual, I had to say, mm, like, we can't talk about that right now. Why? Because it's going to lead me back to a place that I no longer want to be. So, yeah. All right. And another thing was taking every thought captive. So the word of God says we are to take every thought captive and that exalts itself against the, the knowledge of God. So any, even after doing these things, I would have to take every thought captive, every thought of lust, every thought of defiling my body, like just any thought. And I would have to say, I take you thought of lust and I command you to be obedient to the word of God, which says that I shall be pure, that I shall walk in purity, that God called me to think on things that are noble, to think on things that are pure. A lot of times we realize that these thoughts run in our mind and that we don't capture them and command them to be obedient to the word of God. So if you have these thoughts of lust, you you capture it and you say, "Mm mm-mm. Thought of lust, I command you to be obedient to the word of God, which states that I shall be pure, that I shall think on things that are pure, that I shall think on things that are noble. And 
when when I started doing this and I started taking these thoughts captive, I realized that they no longer had the opportunity to settle. And so the next day I wasn't I wasn't being tempted anymore or as much as I was because I had already taken that thought captive. So it didn't have a chance to take root. All right. So those are the three practical steps that I did. So take inventory of the things that led me to sin. Take inventory of the things that control my thoughts and then taking every thought captive. All right. And so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is the spiritual steps. So the spiritual steps that I took was fasting and prayer. I remember listening to a podcast where a woman, it was the the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast where a woman was talking about how God called her to go on a fast for like one Monday every 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 day of the week for the whole year. Now, God may not instruct you to do that exact same fast. Like he may call you to do another day or you may choose to do another day or you may choose it to be a different frequency. But um, one of the scriptures is um, when the disciples, let me pull it up that way I can give y'all. I hope you save this. I love testimonies. Got to go, but want to come back in here. May you continue in freedom. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I definitely will save this. That way, anybody who may not have caught it can catch it. All right. Matthew. All right, so it's Matthew 17. Hey, beautiful. So Matthew 17, where the disciples are trying to cast out a demon. Um, Hold on, hold on. 21. All right. For the sake of time, I'm like, um, this kind of only comes out through prayer and fasting. Why could we not cast it out? All right. I want to make sure I got the right translation because the translation, this translation kind of matters because one of the ones don't have the fasting part in there. But yeah, while I'm looking for this, I started praying and fasting due to me hearing about a woman and she was talking about how God called her to go on a fast. And she brought up the scripture how some things only go out by prayer and fasting and so y'all remember how i was saying how i would be in the church and i would be crying begging snotting (laughs) like god like i no longer want to do this like i no longer want to be bound by this thing and sometimes we find ourselves praying and praying and praying and praying praying so we feel like we can't pray no more And my question is, have you tried going on a fast? And uh, one of the, and the fast that I'm talking about is a fast from no food um, for a certain period of time where you are replacing your meals with the bread of life or with the word of God and truly attacking the area that you are seeking freedom in on your fast. All right, so I got it. So in Matthew 17, Verse 20 and through 21. So before this, the disciples were trying to cast out a little boy with a demon and they couldn't do it. Like they, they, it, they just failed. And then after this, they asked Jesus like, Hey, why couldn't we cast this thing out? So in Matthew chapter 17, verse 19, it says, then came the disciples to Jesus apart. 
and said, why could we not cast him out? And verse 20 says, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? This kind goeth out not but by prayer and fasting. So some of the things and some of the mountains in my life that I found that wouldn't move, this was one of them. Like the porn addiction, this was one of them. It was one that I, that I felt like I had kept going back to over and over and over again. Like I'm praying, I'm crying, I'm going to the altar saying, hey, can you pray for me? Like I just need some help. And I'm going, I'm like, God, I don't longer want to do this thing no more. And then I, I, I found that at the, the right time when I needed it, I had somebody say this specific scripture to me is that some things only go out by prayer and fasting. So during this time, I picked a day during the week that I would fast. I, I, I fasted without food for about, honestly, Everybody's time frame may be different, but I did it for uh, one day during the week for some months. And during this time, I would say um, I had at first I set a goal and my goal was freedom from porn addiction. So when you're going into fast, make sure you set a goal of what you are expecting to have out of that fast. So for me during this time, it was freedom from the addiction of pornography. And during this fast, I was praying. I was like, God, um, I pray that the roots of, of pornography in me be uprooted in the name of Jesus Christ. God, you call me to be pure. Um, um, another scripture that I was thinking that I would pray was uh, temptation, temptation. That you have not called us to be tempted beyond Anything that we could measure. Hold on. Um, I just want to make sure I'm saying it right. Okay, there we go. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And so I was proclaiming this over me, like, God, you will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I can bear. Um, God, I proclaim that even throughout this, that God, even when I'm feeling the temptations of porn, that God, I know that you have always provided a way of an escape for me. God, I know that you have always provided a way from an escape for me. Um, so God, I pray that I can, I can walk in that. And um, I I'm trying to think of another scripture. So the main thing of the spiritual steps is with prayer and fasting, start going through scriptures that you can use to pray during your fast so that you know what to attack and you know what to come into agreement with. And I have another scripture here. It says Romans 6, 6, we know that. Our old self was crucified with him. So we're talking about Jesus. So our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And so this was another thing to attack in prayer that, God, I'm no longer a slave to this sin. I'm no longer bound by this sin. One of the definitions of slave is a person who is legally owned by someone else and has to work for that person. And so you realize that when you have these urges, you feel as if you're working for the enemy. You feel as every time he says, watch it, you can't like you can't even say no. Even if you try, you, you find yourself being drawn to watch this thing. You find yourself being a slave to this thing. And so it's understanding that God, that Jesus came so that we are no longer bound and we're no longer slaves to this sin, but that he that but that he's freed us. And so. That was the spiritual step is finding every single prayer or every single scripture that I could use in prayer to attack this thing. And 
the fasting along with the praying. And one of the things I want to say is, is that sometimes one fast may not work. Sometimes you may find that you start even you start. It feels like it's getting worse. You feel like your urges are getting stronger and stronger. And I want to encourage you that do not stop. Sometimes you have to continue to, to pray and fast. The Bible says pray without ceasing. So do this thing without ceasing until you see breakthrough. And I believe that even after, sometimes even after you see breakthrough, <laughs> you still want to make sure you continue and attack, um, continue to attack this thing with the word of God. Yeah. I, honestly, I, I feel like that is, I feel like that's it. I feel like that's it. I don't know. I think I answered all my questions. Um, and I feel like I answered them in in the whole talk. But does anybody have any questions that they would like me to answer? And I do want to thank y'all for joining. Thank you so much. It means a lot. My plan is to start going live a little bit more. And I'll definitely start letting, start sending out some notifications whenever I do. But yeah. But if you do have any questions or anything, I know sometimes this topic can be a little, a little uncomfortable for people, especially when you have a public platform like this and your situation may be a little personal. You may not be somebody that wants to share it out in the open. Um, if you want to DM me, you can. And I will do my best to get back to your DM and answer your question if I have an answer to your question. Yeah. So thank you so much, guys, for joining my live. I hope you all have a great night. And I'm going to try and save this live. So.